Hi, folks. Uh, welcome to week six. Uh, I think what we're going to find this week is a nice uh, continuation of uh, week five, chapter 10 in here to uh, chapter 11 with a couple of uh, a couple of twists. Uh, the first twist being this. If you recall last week when we talked about hypothesis testing, we talked about uh, in, that's, in those scenarios, all we were dealing with was one single variable. Uh, and uh, the change that you're going to see this week as we get into chapter 11 is now we're going to start looking at a similar approach, hypothesis testing, but we'll be looking at two samples where we'll be comparing sample means on what we consider to be independent and dependent samples. Uh, what's an independent sample? An independent sample would be, uh, or an independent test would have uh, two samples that really have no inherent connection. And uh, uh, what I'm gonna do here, uh, before I talk about dependent samples, you've got uh, some uh, problems from chapter 11 this week, 14, 41, 48, 49 in a case. What I want to do is I want to talk through uh, problems 14 and 41. Uh, problem 14 um, has um, is basically a case where you have independent samples, and problem number 41 is a situation where you have dependent samples. And more specifically, a dependent sample uh, or dependent samples would be those that have some sort of inherent uh, connection between the two. And I will, it, it, I think it will be very clear when we get to the setup on problem 41, how that differs from problem number 14. Uh, I, actually, I'm going to demonstrate problem number 13 for you. A couple of, uh, a couple of twists from last week that I want to discuss right off the bat. Uh, because we are talking about uh, two different samples, uh, especially in the independent case, uh, and because we will be using a t, 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 uh, sorry, t statistic to do this test of hypothesis, uh, obviously the number of degrees of freedom involved uh, becomes important. And because there, is, uh, because there are two samples and the number of uh, samples or number of observations in each sample are likely going to be different, the way that we compute the number of degrees of freedom is uh, really kind of, kind of involved if you look at this equation, but I think it's something that you can do fairly simply in Excel or in your calculator. And what it's based on is the variance of the first sample and the number of observations in the first sample, and then the uh, variance in the second sample and the number of data points in the second sample. So that's what this entire calculation is based on. And it's really just a little bit of math to find out the number of degrees of freedom that would be involved in, a, uh, in an independent test of two samples. I think the only thing else I will say about this is notice that this is a fractional relationship. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to put my cursor on this line that goes right through here to show you where I would say what the big denominator or big numerator is. Uh, it's this piece is the numerator of the fraction. And then the denominator of the fraction is this piece. And notice that there are two uh, rational pieces to that, uh, one here and one here. So just remember, as you go through and do the, co the uh, computation here, that this is the dividing line of the numerator and the denominator. Uh, the other thing here, uh, and we will follow the six-step process that we talked about in Chapter 10 for hypothesis testing. Uh, one of the twists that you will find here is that especially uh, or, or specifically in the independent sample case, the test statistic is computed using the difference of the sample means in the numerator. And then you have, uh, in the denominator, you have the square roots uh, of these fractions, uh, the variance of the first sample divided by uh, the number of observations in the first sample, and then plus a similar uh, fractional relationship, the variance of the second sample divided by the number of data points in the second sample. All of this is easily computed uh, in Excel or in your calculator. So uh, right off the bat, a couple of twists, uh, though, they're, though they fit into that six step process, uh, a little bit of uh, different, um, or a different approach here on the computation, specifically for the number of degrees of freedom to help you find your uh, T critical values and then uh, computing your test statistic. So as we look at uh, what I want to do here, chapter uh, 11, problem 13, is somewhat similar 
uh, to problem 14. Uh, but if I, I think if we go through 13, it'll give you a gist of what we're going to do for problem 14. Uh, first of all, there's no scenario here. So I'll talk about the details that we need to go through the test itself. Uh, the first thing uh, we notice here is another, another twist. Uh, and like I said last week in hypothesis testing, you know, really, I think the biggest challenge in hypothesis testing is making sure you get the statements of the hypotheses correct. And there's really uh, that same premium this week. But notice, uh, again, since we are talking about two samples, uh, in this specific example, there's a difference between 13 and 14. Let me, let me just uh, for now say, notice the difference, and then we will talk about uh, how uh, this, uh, this setup sort of differs from this, and it's all based on the statement of the problem. Uh, so first of all, uh, we're assuming that the uh, that we have um, that we do not have equal variances. You'll hear about that in your reading, and we're going to test this uh, this, or we're going to compare these two samples at the 0.05 level of significance. So we're going to go through and uh, find the number of degrees of freedom, state the decision rule, compute the test statistic, and then state the decision about the hypothesis. And the hypotheses are this. In this case, we're just going to assume that, uh, that there is no difference between the population means of the two samples. When we go down here and we see that uh, mu1 is not equal to mu2, that's basically saying uh, we're just looking for a difference, meaning that mu1 could be greater than mu2 or mu2 could be greater than mu1. And it's not really important here uh, from the mechanical standpoint other than to say that uh, when you set up the hypotheses, it will again be very clear from the statement of the problem how they are going to be set up. So if you were to actually see a problem like this, we would be, you know, looking for some language that say, you know, test uh, to find that there is a difference in the population means. So a difference would be either that, like I said, that mu1 be, would be greater than mu2 or mu2 would be greater than mu1. So uh, then the, uh, the key information that you need here, a random sample of 15 items. So that's going to be N1 as a population mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 5. And then a sample of 12 items. So that's your N2. Uh, let's see, showed a mean of 46 and a standard deviation of 15. So that's your second standard deviation. So as I said, uh, going through and computing the number of degrees of freedom, that follows uh, this equation that we just talked about from uh, chapter 11, uh, equation 11-6. Uh, so you can go through and compute that. Notice that the number of degrees of freedom comes out to 12.96. Uh, always when you get the fractional relationship with degrees of freedom, we want to round that down. So the number of degrees of freedom for uh, this scenario will be 12. And so with uh, 12 degrees of freedom, and a level of significance of 0.05, you can dig into your uh, T distribution table and find that your critical values are negative uh, 2.179 and 2.179. Again, the reason that we show both is because we would accept or we would reject the null hypothesis if there is a difference between uh, the two means. Again, either mu1 being greater than mu2 or mu2 being greater than mu1 based on our uh, test statistic. So again, uh, the next step again, so once you have the hypotheses and you know the number of degrees of freedom and you know your T critical values, your test statistic here, the difference of the two means, and then uh, let's see, variance one divided by um, the sample size of sample one, and then variance two divided by the sample size of sample two gives you a test statistic of 0.885, which is less than uh, let's see, 2.179. So very similar to what we did last week. That would lead you to a conclusion uh, where you would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So this uh, should be a good overview for uh, the case where you have independent samples. Let's look at the setup for problem 41. Uh, before I talk about uh, the, the test statistic, which has a little twist to it, obviously, uh, notice here that we're talking about a before and after of uh, some sort of soap that's being, or antibacterial soap that's being used in a, I think, in a operating room in Seattle. So as, as I said before, when you have a situation where you have an inherent relationship between the variables, this is what we would consider to be a dependent test of hypothesis of two samples. So as we have uh, this... Um, sample 
where, uh, or we have the situation where the samples are dependent. Notice that the test statistic here, the numerator becomes the average of the differences, and this is explained in the book, what we'll look at is the difference in the before and after, and we'll take the average of that. That becomes the numerator. Once you take and find all those, or once you find all those differences, you can find the standard deviation in the differences, and then you're dividing by the square root of the sample size. So no freaky, no freaky calculation here for the number of degrees of freedom in a dependent test. Uh, the number of degrees of freedom here will just be n minus one. And I think our n here is uh, going to be eight. So I'm gonna cut this here because I'm gonna do a second video here and show you how to go through this in Excel. What, what I will want you to do is uh, certainly this, the first time that you do this, I want, I want you to go through and do all the calculations manually, but I will show you how to do it in Excel because I think that will be very helpful for you, do, for you as you do problems 48, 49, and the case, uh, some Excel uh, exposure will be helpful since you got a bunch of data there. And once you go through this calculation once, again, going through the test statistic, uh, again, you, you'll know how to find your T-critical values. And then uh, the test statistic, like I said, uh, is pretty straightforward in here. Once you go through and uh, when, I, um, when I show you in Excel how this is going to happen, I think it'll be very straightforward. You, you know, what you're looking at here is the differences in the before and after to come up with this uh, portion of the numerator. And then once you have the eight differences in this case, you can find the standard deviation of that. And that makes this really quite simple. So I'll halt this right here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fire up Excel and I'm gonna do uh, this problem for you in Excel. And uh, again, I think that will be very helpful to you uh, as you do problems 48, 49 in the case. So I'll halt here and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you in the Excel tutorial.